Casey Berger with Creative Outcomes, and today I'm with Judith, and we are discussing um, the importance of play. (laughs) And in the background, we have a puppy who is um, playing right now, and the irony is we discuss this. So today we are talking about play. (laughs) And um, before... We started this. I had sent Judith an email because we always say, hey, what are we going to talk about? And uh, I love I love talking about the science behind play. So I'm going to put this out there. One of my favorite TED Talks is with Stuart Brown, and he is a neuroscientist. And he, I, I like at the beginning of the TED Talk because he says, yes, they will give me grant money for I don't know, felons and alcoholism. (laughs) But when you tell them you want to do research on play, they're like, well, that's not really something serious that we have to be doing research about. I'd say in this time in our life, it probably couldn't be more important than ever. Correct. So, um, and I, and I want to follow that up with before, because I I do want to just talk about the science and it's really quickly. Basically, play lights up your entire brain, especially the cerebellum. And he has a picture of a mom with the baby right at the beginning of play, and the mom's smiling, and the baby's smiling, and there's goo goo and gaga, and right. And he said, when they did um, the MRIs and the EGs, and they said the right, the entire right side of the brain lit up for both of them. And it has so much to do with the regeneration of the neurons and this and that. And so um, to me, I just think that's it. So yes, it does so much for the brain in such a good way. The second research that he talked about, which I thought was interesting, is we have animals here in the room with me, um, one that is playful, is he, uh, there's this research about uh, rats, right? And the rats, there's rats and then there are cats. And there was almost like this sense of when the rats saw the cats, everything was fine. It was okay. And then there was obviously the play stopped sense of, uh oh, a predator, correct? And then um, they removed the cats, right? Tensions come down and the rats were like, okay, this is fine. We're back to normal. All right, we're going to play. They brought in just like a leash smelling of a cat and it created so much fear. The play had stopped. It's just really interesting. And actually those, some rats kind of overcame it and came out of their hole for a better choice of words. Some did not um, retreated back within their cubbies, did not come out and eventually died. And so again, going to survival Phyllis the survival of the fittest, but that there was at one time, the sense of play, the sense of, okay, this is fine. And then when it changed to predator, correct, fear arose, stress arose, rats retreated, even though the cats did not return, just a leash, a scent, a smell, some of the rats came back out, they were okay, we're going to play again, everything's fine. And some did not, and then in essence died. And what he's saying is that once there is this transition of the brain, apparently, where we change this play into fear, um, that it can, in essence, affect our uh, will to live. Um, and it, in one part, he actually said this, the opposite of play is depressed. And I was like, wow, that's an interesting word. It's an interesting word. So please, uh, for those listeners out there, Watch Stuart Brown if you haven't seen him. Um, I haven't been on his website lately. It's something I do promote, though, because he is into the science of play. But then we have the spiritual side of play. And um, I always say they're both connected, right? We have science. And now we have this opportunity to share the spiritual side of it. And I always, um, I don't know, to me, it's just lighter. Mm. Play makes us feel lighter Mm -hmm. until there's something that changes it, right? Alters it. 
like he said, we go from this sense of weight, predator, weight, no longer play, fear, and then a change, a shift occurs. And I think as human beings, you know, it's having this sense of awareness and awareness as a parent and saying, okay, shift has occurred. Judith and I prior to were discussing when do you step in? Um, so, yeah. Any thoughts? <laughs> Oh, always thoughts. Um, I, I was making notes as you were chatting there and um, thinking how important in my intuitive work when I'm doing animal communication or any sort of um, psychic work, how important the raising of the vibration is. Mm. Um, it's, it's crucial for that telepathic connection to flow easily when the joy is present, when the fun is present and of course when play is happening play is typically joyful and that mm. is the underpinning of telepathy so it's really not a, a quantum leap to make to go from saying we should really support our children in their play because that will immediately impact their intuitive abilities which will result in more compassion on the playground, better learning in the classroom. Well, and we know that I, um, there's, uh, I think the current research as far as play and schools and learning and education is from out of Texas, because I know there are many schools in Texas who have mandated at least two recesses a day, mm -hmm. which I love going, you know I mean? I went to a private Catholic strict school, correct? And I remember they were like, oh, no, we're going to you get two day with then we'd have like that 15 in the morning and that 15, in, I think, probably just to give the teachers a break. But yeah. it does. It helps. And so the current research out of Texas, a lot of schools have returned to increasing their recess time because they found out the kids are retaining more and they want to learn and they're not, you know. So, yes, so I think in. in um Finland, where I think the education system seems to be excelling, um, the amount of time in play is extraordinary. It, most Americans look at their school day and imagine how could they ever possibly learn anything because they're just right. always playing. Um, but the, they know what's up. They know that the children need that freedom and space and exploration and an and area where they're they can be fearless because of course we know that fear of, Oh my God, the teacher's going to call on me and I'm so embarrassed. I don't want to say the wrong answer. That fear, although it's a strong word, affects the limbic system, of course, and a child will not ask a question, will not. That's correct. I didn't understand because of the shame. I don't want to be the only one not understanding. So they just shut down. They don't ask questions and um, the learning is not far, it's far from optimum. So for true learning to happen effortlessly, there needs to be a sense of safety and joy in a learning environment, not necessarily yeah. a school, but in any learning situation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, we always talk about that. That's yeah. priority. So... And of course, in play, there's no judgment. Mm. If you're playing with your friends and you're playing with Spider-Man and, and whatever, nobody's stepping in and saying, hey, hang on a sec, that's not how you play Spider-Man. <laughs> there's right. no judgment. The kids are making up their own rules, their own fantasy, and they are naturally and intuitively problem-solving. And believe it or not, uh, they work it out. It may they not do. be the way adults think they should work it out, but they work it out. Well, it's, uh, so as we were talking about earlier before, it's having the children, um, you know, it, we were talking about today's world. And so there's a lot of violence that's occurring, correct? And so as a mom, right? Sure. We're well, noticing it more. We're, than, right, we're noticing it more. Yeah. And so, but in this 
filter as a parent, right? Um, even like, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but at schools, if a kid points their finger like a pretend gun, um, children get in trouble for that. Um, severe. Like, um, so there is a, a filter as a parent to go, ah, you know, your kids are playing and one says, oh, I'm going to shoot you. And then ah, chaos erupts. And um, I think it takes an aware parent to, you know, is it, like you said, it is, do we just, dis- do we disrupt it? Or to me, I would just have conversations with my children, you know, like um, even this, the idea of what's happening in cartoons, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. Should we, because many parents are like, no, you cannot even watch SpongeBob. Um, you know, that, that can be very bad. And I think I always want to go with, my older son, I think that that's interpretive. Um, It's kind of like the story. He he loved Peter Pan, loved Peter Pan. And uh, when he was at one particular school, they had summer homework. So they had to read a book. And so it's his favorite. I would love to read Peter Pan. But then it got into the interpretation of the theme and it literally just took away the fun and his imagination of reading and even the fun, like to, to play like Peter Pan, right? It took it away from him. Hmm. And because the school said, well, the theme said this, and he's just reading for the fun of it. He really didn't care about. And so again, it's, it's, the adult authoritarian, and I'm guilty of it, our filter through which we see because of the fear that, you know, oh my gosh, they're going to end up, you know, shooting, harming somebody, wanting a gun, this and that. And, but that wasn't the truth. Mm. It wasn't the truth. Correct. And so I think they're does absolutely have to be this sense of awareness um, of, is it mine? You know, is this, is this my, the kids are just playing, everybody's okay. The awareness to know if things are going to go south, take a turn, whatever. Um, you know, it's funny. I think of, well, I should ask you this, Judith, since you had a class. And now, did you guys have meetings? So in this free and democratic schools, children create the roles. And in some of them, they have meetings if there's an altercation. So that's a, that's a great question. I don't know if something like this came up where children were playing. Maybe it took a turn and then a meeting was created to have a discussion. I'm curious to know what was the outcome. Let me think about that. Um, yeah, we had instances when the children were not children, they were teens, um, were given free reign to speak their truth. And then that didn't always pan out easily i don't know if that's where you're going but okay um it took some it takes a very evolved soul so here's an example um we had cooking classes at uh, yellowwood and at that time i was newly vegan and felt rather passionate about veganism and um so when it came to the cooking classes, I, I suggested, I said, I, I would love for you to not harm any animals if possible. And um, one of the kids came to me in the break and said, you know, I think that's really unfair that you're foisting your um, ideals on the entire 
school, entire school. It wasn't that big a school. Um, and as Judith, the little person, I sort of pushed back at that momentarily, thinking, yes, but it's my school and I started it. You know, the ego jumped in immediately. And then I had to really just watch myself from a different perspective and say, no, this is exactly what you want. You want the kids to be questioning things and having a voice and allowing their voices to be heard. And so we did. We, we all got together and we had a little meeting about it and said, you know, should the cooking classes be um, include using dairy products and what have you because it's up to the individual families or should we as a school as a collective considering I founded it kind of have this umbrella guideline of never hurting animals and so the kids voted on it and they decided no we want to eat whatever the we want <laughs> <laughs> And right. if we want to kill poor animals and eat them, then we will. And I totally had to respect that. And it, it wasn't easy. That It was a moment, let me tell you. <laughs> but, yeah. um, it, you know, so I may have gone off on a tangent, but I really believe for anyone who wants to start a learning community or any sort of homeschool cooperative, if the intention is to really allow everyone to have a voice, um, that voice needs to be heard. And yes. even if it's going round and round and round many, many times until all voices are heard, then, then that, that's what needs to happen. So it's not very convenient, uh, which is why traditional schools can't accommodate such a thing because the bell rings at this time, lunch is 20 minutes or however long they have for lunch. And there's no room for extended conversations or um, a healing that needs to happen before returning to the classroom. So I don't know if that answered your question at all. I'm a bit of a queen of the tangent. <laughs> no, 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 you're perfect because I wanted to go back to that children are capable of figuring things out. And so there was, uh, I th and I think it was the Brooklyn school. There was a great little movie on YouTube and this little girl, you know, they were playing and I think with pretend swords and she might've, you know, hit one a little too hard. And so or I think she got hit too hard or she was walking. And so she, you know, as they, shows as a group of students that if there's uh, a disagreement, you could bring it to the group. And mm -hmm. so she did. And so she's yelling through, I call a meeting, I call a meeting. It's really cute. And it's all exactly the camera's on her. And so she goes in and they call a meeting and they have like a little squishy ball and they pass the ball to whoever's speaking. That's something they also chose. And in the irony, uh, I mean, I mean, there, it was a multiple age room and, you know, she makes her statement, her claim, because this was in play. It was just that she was very upset that she got hit too hard and that shouldn't have happened. And I remember the other boys and, and no one, everyone is equal. Okay. And so everybody passed the ball and they asked her specific, no adult engaged at all. And it came down to, you know, I think the other child, same age, we were just playing. We didn't, you know, we didn't do it on purpose, but I got hit. And well, the ball goes to her, she goes, but I got hit. And, okay. You know, and the, the end result is, do you accept if they apologize to you? Yes. You know, and so there it was, it was in the sense of play, children were able to work it out on their own by without an adult intervention, even for her to have the courage to speak up to something that she felt was an injustice. But I think in our traditional school system, because it is such a hierarchy, <laughs> right? And I'm going to tell on you and you're going to accept your punishment there is no collaboration of let's have a, let's down, have a talk. Everyone gets to 
explain their sides, which is what occurred. Other students listen to the story. They make their observations. And then they come to a conclusion without any adult intervening unless they see fit that they need to at some time. Yeah. Um, because again, like I said, here I am as a parent, right? I have my own filter. Oh, this is wrong. This is going to create violence. But then when I watch and observe that in these free and democratic schools, and I see how children respond and able to work it out on their own, um, I am reminded that it is my own filter of fear, uh-huh. just the truth, my own filter of fear. And that, and that is something I would always tell the boys, you know, it's, and I fully take responsibility for my own behavior. Mm-hmm. I fully take responsibility that I'm making this choice because I have a lot of fear because this happened to me and I just, I, you know, it would feel awful it happened to you because I don't want them to take on the programming that I carry and that mom's responsible for some of the choices that I'm making. I would so. love to add um, that I think our very microscopic focus, our perspective um, does not do us any favors. Um, yeah. In there's a Japanese TV show or something called uh, Never Too Young. Um, I don't know how I caught a clip of this, but I did for some strange reason. And they teach their children to be incredibly independent. And in the clip that I watched, literally a, was he three or four? He was a little tiny tot and he had to walk to the, the town center and buy some things and um, not with an adult, by himself. Mm. And this is considered part of um, how they learn. And to an American's sensibilities, it would seem horrific. He's yes. crossing major roads, <laughs> he's in a supermarket by himself. Um, so I, th- I think at times we get very myopic with our cultural biases and mores because it's incredibly powerful and sensible when we empower them yes we and i our children by saying oh you you can't do that that's not you're you're not in fifth grade yet i'm right. sure they can if they're ready for it then let them do it we hold our children back i think in so many ways um when really they are they're ready for anything if we allow them to be, you know, little Greta Thunberg causing one of the greatest strikes yes. in the history of education, um, a Joan of Arc leading an army, you know, the, we, we forget how each child is not a child. They are a piece of remarkable energy. Capable that has of all the, of, and they carry all the answers with them. Oh, yeah. Of course, yeah. Which which we all do. I think when I think of just if if we could change one thing, um, and I I do look forward to my discussion with Carl again. Uh, so Carl is a it's teachers unschooling schools, and he decided to go back and cover for uh, the rest of the year in this classroom. And our discussion was out of anything, he's hoping. You know, he had them create the rules in the classroom. And because, and I think it's sixth grade already at this stage of the game, you know, they, of course, want to come up with the rules that they've been programmed to create, Mm -hmm. you know, because if they, you know, it's just already been normalized in them by sixth grade. No, no, we should have. You know, and then he kind of sees that they're slowly relaxing, like like there's this tension. There's, um, but if I were to say an opportunity um, for great change within the system is to allow students to create the rules in the classroom, and if we started it 
from day one, then they won't have that programming of this is how it's supposed Then they'll have the programming like if we have authority in the classroom of, you know, so that that I think would be such a beautiful part of change, you know, as we know it in the traditional school system, mm-hmm. because it really, um, it, I just think it's a game changer right then. There. Okay, you create oh, girls. Absolutely. Because anything that empowers young people to understand their true nature, which is their true self, then it will shift the dynamics forever in the best way possible. When children understand who they really are within a a framework of loving guidance, if they just are left to their own devices, I'm not entirely convinced that is 100% in the best interest of a healthy development because um, egos, unless you're starting with children all at the same age, that come from unblemished families, <laughs> then you might stand a chance. But that's not the case. You get children, even as young as, how old were they at Yellowwood? They were five. And already at five, they're coming in with massive personal histories, inherited yes. programs, and already thinking that they're separate. And the ego is already well formed by that time. Absolutely. So, um, some not so much. So the ones that were still open were just so loving, so trusting, so fun, so joyful. But there were many that were quite the opposite. Well, and I, I would like to share with people that um, in these self-directed um, democratic schools, as far as play goes, I think what I... Two, if we go back to play, so we talked about roles and then the sense of play. And if you watch any of the videos in these schools, these kids are playing. Mostly what I see on all the different videos from the various schools is till about 16. Then like some of their friends might have started picking up a class here and there. And in these um, self-directed schools, what they'll have is that's part of a child's choice, right? I would like to try some math. And then, and I love it. The one boy says, well, I was kind of playing video games the whole time and just playing and hanging out. And then uh, about 16, he goes, I thought, well, I, I'll take a lesson. And he took a lesson in guitar. Then he knows his other friends started taking math. And he thought to himself, I just love this story because he was just so honest, number one. Yeah. And he was like, oh, math, I just don't know. And then he's like, well, everyone else is taking it, so I guess I'll try it. And I think then they had somebody from a college come in and talk, and he was thinking to himself, well, I don't know if I want to go to college, but maybe, and yeah, okay, well, I guess I'll take this math class. But it was all on his own, and but to understand, I mean, to even think about a child being able to play <laughs> from kindergarten until the age of 16, which is 10th, 11th grade, versus confined. Yeah, yeah. Told us to, so that sense of freedom, that sense of play, of just being able to let go and just be and do what they want. You know, I, I love love the sound of music. It's one of my favorite movies. And my favorite part of that movie is when they're coming back and the father is in his car with his future fiance. But they're in the trees all with this, right? And playing and, you know, yelling and screaming. And one of the things, because I was in an unschool group, because we had our homeschool group, but we had these group of unschoolers that would hang out and we would take the kids an extra day and they would all meet to the park. And literally I I would just loved because they would go off and just do their thing. And they would you do climb a tree. You know, you'd always see those kids in a tree and, you know, how lovely on the playground playing to, you know, it was just play. Mm. 
It was just play. And I wouldn't change that for anything. Well, so much learning, so much important learning is embedded in and invisibly woven into play. Absolutely. At Yellowwood, we had, um, you, and that's why the, the guides are so crucial because just a, a loving parent that leans over and says, huh, um, that's a cool sandcastle or mud pie or whatever, um, looks pretty heavy. And just that sort of comment or question, and then the child's thinking, is it? Uh -huh, let me pick it up. And then already the, I, the concept of weight or the Correct. wet mud versus the dry, or whatever lesson the adult wants to surreptitiously slip in there rather than stop playing children, we have to do a math lesson. <laughs> you know, right. It was all invisible at Yellowwood. We would just sort of yeah. go, huh, that's curious. It, it, what made you mix those colors that way? And then the kids would say, well, I found that when I mixed this with this, it made a really like yucky brown color. But when I did this, like, oh, well, that's cool. Which one do you prefer? And yeah. just sort of being the, the voice of curiosity out loud to help them join the dots in a way, not that they needed any help, but that's why really skillful, loving guides, a.k.a. parents or teachers or whatever, we want to call the loving adult guide, um, they're so crucial, crucial, because they understand the psychology of play. They understand how never to, to comment on it, never to say, oh, you look, how, let's count your mud pies. Here's one. Here's right. One. How many is one plus one, Timmy? Yes, All I right, think that's, that's, called, that's called developmentally appropriate practice <laughs> is what they call that today, right? We're still, we have this belief system that they are empty until we fill them up. And that yes. is simply not the truth. Yes. And I've seen it happen so often from parents who, who really not should know better, but you would think they, they sound awake and enlightened, but then you'll overhear them playing with the kids and their stickers and saying, um, well, yes, what's this dinosaur? Oh, this is yeah, a, yeah. a Tyrannosaurus. Oh, good job, Tyrannosaurus. And I always want to say, do you have to be teaching them stuff? Let right. them play. Yeah. And then just ask the questions. Oh, that's cool. Why is that? Right, dinosaur? that's cool. Love that. That's cool, right. Just ask questions and then let them try to figure it out rather than telling them all the time, you know? Which isn't necessarily the truth. <laughs> and there is no truth, is there? But right, right. No so <laughs> I laugh because even if I can encourage, so I, I was going to say encourage parents to play, play with your children, sit on the floor. Even when having the puppy here, I will try to sit on the floor. I have to tell myself, I need to sit on the floor. And whether she lays on me, you know, she wants to flop. She wants to put, you know, my hand in her mouth. And, um, but I, it's just a connection and it's play and it's play for her. And we tug a war and we <laughs> whatever is in front of us. Um, but, um, was I going to say, just going back to play, I noticed because I thought about myself growing up and, and I, I thought this was really interesting. So I played sports growing up and I played sports again, kind of lower income area. It gave me something to do. I mean, we didn't have video games back then. Right. But when I saw my brothers and sisters playing sports, it was fun, you know, and then they would say, hey, come on, why don't you come play? And this is how you hold the bat. And, and I was like, wow. And I get to be with my friends and OK. And that, I remember being little and I was really scared. And um, but I joined and I got hooked. I mean, from fall uh, let's see. So I did in the elementary school, it was cheerleading. Right. And you. And then in the winter, I play basketball and then softball in the spring. And I did that at a very early age. And it was never, ever about 
ah, this is what I have to learn. It was never about, I'm going to do this through college and I'm going to get a scholarship. It Hmm. was always about play. I think there was one time I took it very serious and it wasn't even a college scholarship thing. It was, wow, I'm hitting really well. And I think if I did that, if I continue for my arms to do this, you know, like something snapped in me that went, oh, oh, then I can, I can continue to hit the ball really well. Right. So it was just something like, other than that, it was more to, I, it was great exercise. It kept me out of trouble. Um, and I loved that even though in high school it was tougher because, you know, you had school, you had classes and then I played sports. Um, but it was really just more of a social. I got to be with my friends and I remember doing things like singing on the bus and um, it was a connection. Um, yeah. So it's interesting because now sports is okay. We're going to start at age seven or eight. We're going to do club sports. Right. And then they're going to keep going. And my, my oldest son, he did archery, you know, it's no different than my other son who did a school of rock, but he loved it. That was his creative. And he went to all stars, but it was still play. Cause he got to not only play his music, but in the irony, all stars was all about the experience with the other kids. Like they already knew how to play the songs, right? And yes. They got to go on a tour, but what he remembers the most were his connections with the other kids. Mm. That was the play. That was the laughter, the fun, the silliness, the camaraderie. Um, and, and that it wasn't, you know, okay, you're going to be a rock, rock and roll star. Even for my older son, when he did um, Joe Ed, which is the archery, it was fun as exciting when it, it, he had difficulties, he had to have surgery and he came back and he did okay. And then he was just, for some reason he saw, <laughs> because it was the pre Olympic junior archery Olympic division. He literally sat on the bleachers with me. He was like doing the next, that tournament before he would to decide if he wanted to go for the Olympics And he sat next to me so beautifully. So I think he was 13, 14. And he sat on the bench. He had been 15. He wasn't driving yet. And he says, mom, because he met with an Olympic coach. Okay. And he said, I don't want to practice for 16 hours out of a day and shoot 600 arrows. And, you know, I... That just doesn't sound fun to me. So the fun left. It wasn't playful anymore. It wasn't, oh my God, I get to shoot with my friends. And yeah, I shot a really good game, but I'm going to go talk to my friend. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he got to be with people who were doing the same thing. And it was fun and exciting. He didn't care if he was losing or not. Who cared? Well, this, the very same anecdote happened with um, a, an animal communicator who was working with horses and competition. And this one horse who had been just a stellar performer and always won all the jumping and what have you, suddenly started just losing everything. And um, they brought in an animal communicator and the horse said, you know, just the fun went. Everyone was so serious about just winning. And I just like to jump and play and, and, and have, joy yes so even in the animal world the exact same thing uh can apply you yeah, know the joy. Cool when he was having fun and then when it was no longer fun you know so joy and play are just such crucial crucial aspects of young learners experiences and i think there's a difference as far as educators go because I remember starting as a teacher oh well we can we can create fun with this lesson and I think it's almost like we're trying to say oh we're going to add in games we're going to add in games but the yes it makes it more fun without a doubt right that's more fun than sitting there but 
you can't kid a kid. No. <laughs> no. They know what's going on. Yeah. You know, yeah. eventually there's got to be homework and, you know, we have to do all the math problems and this and that. But the Friday fun game day for math was great. And the kids did have a blast. But when it became about, then I get a grade after that, huh? What? Yeah. yeah. The fun just left. So. Exactly. Yeah. So incorporate play. The science is there. Increases your brain power. Yeah. Uh, lights up the right side, especially the cerebellum. And then. As far as energetics goes, um, goodness gracious, the more play we can have in this world, the more the joy, more, the more joy we will have. Absolutely. Joy and laughter is everything. And for anyone who's watched the movie Monsters, Inc., it's, I believe, 100% with all of my heart, that is absolutely how it works. Yes. The power of laughter and joy and love. It's been amazing. proven to heal. It's been proven to heal. That's so, what yes. is. That's what all, um, yeah, it's all just joy and love. And if we can lighten up um, and learn from our children and just listen to the laughter that comes out of them naturally when they're playing freely, then we just need to follow their lead and trust them. Just trust them. And, and I think, too, we've been conditioned for so long. Uh, I met with my girlfriend the other night. We were discussing how when students return to school and he's recovering from chemo. Uh, and so and she said to me very clearly, he wasn't coming back to school. And like he went through all this during COVID as well. He, he's not coming back to school to finish school. He was coming back so he can hang out with his friends and talk because that is what fills him up. That is what is um, healing him, wanting him to fight, right? To fight, to beat this cancer, not because he's coming in to do the homework and stuff. You know, that's, that's, that's not what's pushing him. He just wants to hang out and be with his friends. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a little play, a little joy discussion. So you could find some time to sit with your kids, to sit with your dog or both and go outside and play tag. Oh my God. We did freeze tag for a long time. My son told me, I don't remember that. I said, we played a lot of freeze tag, um, but just, yeah. Bring some joy and laughter into your life. Even at the very hardest and worst times, I think that will enlighten you, enlighten, and lighten up the energy so you can just be with your child and be in the present moment and find a space of love. Yeah, and find a space of love, right? Always. It doesn't take time to, to love our children. It really doesn't. Now, do you know any good books about play? The only one I could think of is by Stuart Brown. I know he has written a book. Um, so I do encourage everyone to check out, check out his TED Talk. It's really cute and funny. and um, But he has some wonderful research if you want to see the science behind play. And just allow. Try not to control uh, what even is happening in play. And just allow things to unfold and see what happens. And giggle. Giggle every yeah. once in a while. I'll just leave with this very short anecdote um, because I think sometimes what stops adults from engaging in play with young learners is a fear of mess or mm. losing control somehow. And so one of the most fun games I ever played with my daughter, um, I'd be cooking pancakes, say, Sunday morning or something. And instead of just cooking the pancakes and then putting them on a plate, she would stand way off down in the hallway and I would get a pancake ready. And when it was ready to go, I would literally toss it into the air, clean up into the, you know, into the sky, into the next room. And she'd so have to catch it on a tray. <laughs> I love it. Catch it. Then she didn't catch it and we laughed and whatever. But 
it was just minutes. It wasn't, you know, let's stop what we're doing and play for an hour. It was just rather than put her pancake on a plate, stand back over there. I'm going to hurl it into the air and you try and catch it on the tray. She's giggling. I'm laughing. It's just I love it. slipping play in any time you can. But that game might fill some parents with absolute horror. What about my carpet or um, yes. what about the furniture? Yeah. So we have to really let go and remember what this is about. It's not about our furniture. <laughs> well, it's not about us. It's, it's no. not about, right. It's just yeah. about allowing them. But that I think that goes for animals as well as I'm yeah. sitting here with the puppy, just letting her explore. I just let her outside, let her explore. Every now and then I'll check on her. And now what I'm seeing is eventually she is following the older dogs and comes back in. And mm-hmm. yeah, because yeah. they're going to watch you. But yes add more yeah. play and um, enjoy the moments. I would like to close before I forget. So uh, both Judith and I, we are available. If you guys would like to and like to promote Judith as um, she is an animal communicator, but I'm going to add this in. She does a reading through your animals for you. So in this idea, yes, she can. And Judith, you can probably explain more um, I have had a reading from Judith and through my dog, Chocolate Lab Alley, and it was incredible, tearful. Um, the details were amazing. So please, um, you can email, you could go to Judith's website at Judith Hurst, H-U-R-S-T dot com. And there's a contact page and you can reach out to her for a personal reading. And then I do readings myself from tarot uh, judith also does energy work i do energy work and i will help connect you with um loved ones from the other side uh to help you reconnect so i think that's it have i forgotten anything judith i don't think so i think you're always very thorough <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone for listening and um yeah we'll see you on the next podcast take care Thanks for listening to the Creative Outcomes Podcast. And if you'd like to learn more, go to my website at tracybrooker.com.